Hey everybody, um, gonna do another video here, um, discussing some things, and a couple weeks back, I felt like the Lord was kind of prompting me, you know, directing my heart to discuss these issues, and I hesitated, and I didn't do it because it is, um, somewhat controversial, um, within the Christian community. And I know there's a lot of opposition to this viewpoint. And so I, I guess I kind of let the fear of man um, dictate what I did and didn't do. And so I, I hesitated to post this. But I do feel like this is the way the Lord's kind of kind of guiding me. This is the direction the Lord wants me to go. And um, so I'm going to go ahead and do it. And... Um, I think I shared before that I feel like the Lord's kind of opening the door here and allowing me to do these videos um, as a ministry tool. I kind of I kind of felt like I hit a wall with just sharing stuff uh, via text, and so I got kind of excited when the Lord put this idea in my mind. Um, this particular topic, um, while it's one of my passions, I, I know just from discussions I've had with fellow Christians that it, that it is controversial, that there is a lot of opposition and, and resistance. But I'm going to go ahead and do it anyways. And um, if, if you're a new believer or if you're an unbeliever, this video is probably not going to be for you. Um, the next couple won't be. I'm going to be getting into eschatology and uh, end times things, specifically on the rapture and the um, so-called tribulation period. And going to kind of get into some complex things. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know if it'll be beneficial or not if, if you're a new believer, but um, I'm also going to post this on YouTube later. So if you can't watch it live, that's fine. Um, but I guess before I get into this, I, I, I'd just like to pray. So if you want to want to bear with me here. Lord, I ask for humility. Please, Lord, keep me low. There's uh, nothing good in me, Lord, and I'm just a, a foolish man. So if anything, anything good is to come out of this, if anybody's to glean anything, it's, it's in spite of me. Help me to remember that, Lord, that I am nothing, and, and you are everything, Lord. And help me to be humble and teachable, Lord. If, if if I'm in error on anything, if I'm wrong on these things, please send somebody to, to show me. Send somebody to correct me. Give me ears to hear. Um, I have to be persuaded by the scriptures, Lord. Your word is my authority, and so... I'm not, uh, I'm not just going to go with what's what's popular and, and what's logical and what sounds good. I want to know what your word has to say. I want the truth in all things, Lord, including end times things, which can be so confusing, Lord. There's so many various opinions out there. It's It's hard to stick to just what your word says. And so I just pray that that would be what happens here, that we would stick to your word that people would not listen to me or listen to anybody else, but they would look to your word and see what your word has to say about these things and to test everything that's said, everything that's heard by the light of your word, um, to compare scripture with what's said and, and to, to test everything by that light and to discard everything that, that contradicts your word or goes against your word, Lord. And I just pray for, um, for clarity, um, uh, and again, for humility, Lord, I just, I know my own heart, Lord. I know how puffed up in my imaginations I can get and, and think of myself more highly than I ought, Lord. Please, please, please keep me humble, Lord. Keep me low. I love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so before getting into the rapture, um, I think it, it's important to kind of... Um, 
look into the tribulation period itself first, because um, I, I think there's a lot of misconceptions on that as well, and there's a lot of there's a lot of the current teaching out there that that's in error, um, and not just current. I, I guess it's kind of been the fad since maybe the seventies. Um, you know, I've heard about the late great planet Earth and and um, stuff like that. Books that came out, I think, in the seventies and in the eighties and the nineties, and until today, when I hear that ninety five percent of the church um, believes in the pre tribulation rapture theory, and I found that shocking when I first got saved because there's literally no scriptural uh, backing for that position. There's nothing. There's no scripture that backs that position. And so that kind of set about my years of studying this because I was just so confused about how people could believe this. But I guess at the same time, you know, when I was a baby Christian, I read the Left Behind series by Tim LaHaye. And um, it was before I understood the word. It was before I was really deep into the scriptures. I just, I knew we were in the end times and I really wanted to understand what was going to happen. And Revelation, the book of Revelation was so confusing to me that I, I picked up these books by Tim LaHaye and um, I don't even know if I was familiar with pre-trib rapture, post-trib rapture, dispensationalism, stuff like that. I just, I thought these books explained Revelation and so it, I kind of got excited about those. Um, but as I grew in the Word and I, I studied the Word, I saw that um, the things in the book, especially the rapture, because I do agree with a lot of the other events that they talk about in those books, but uh, I, I saw that that pre-trib rapture theory was just not found in the scriptures. And then um, as I started to think it through, I started to think, you know, what about this tribulation period? What about this seven-year tribulation period? And so that's what I'm going to get into here. It's, um, is there a seven-year tribulation period coming? So, um, and I, I'm sure anybody who's in the church has heard this, the common explanation for the end times is that a world leader will appear on the scene. Uh, this world leader will be the devil incarnate, known as the Antichrist. And this man will unite the world under one government and one religion. All will follow him, with the exception of the Christian people and the Jewish nation Israel. However, this world leader will guarantee Israel's safety and will sign a seven-year peace treaty with them. Uh, this treaty will instigate the tribulation period that the Bible talks about, also referred to as the, uh, the day of Jacob's trouble, uh, the day of wrath. And supposedly... This is a seven-year period of God's wrath being poured out on the earth. Um, this tribulation period will last for the seven years of this treaty, at the end of which Christ will return, uh, destroy the Antichrist and his system of government. And, and that's the theory. Now, now, this period is commonly divided into two halves. Uh, the first half, where the Antichrist tries to maintain an aura of benevolence. Uh, where this political leader acts as if he's looking out for people's best interests. Uh, this first half of the tribulation will not bring the extreme wrath uh, that we find in the book of Revelation, but rather it's kind of a pre-storm type of wrath of unrest, natural disasters, and wars. Uh, the second half is called the Great Tribulation, and it brings the full onslaught of God's wrath. Uh, the things that we find in the book of Revelation, major hail, fire, wars, disease, demon attacks, stars falling from the sky, um, things of that nature. So now the question is, is this biblical? We've all been taught this idea of a seven-year period so much uh, that we just accept it as fact. But is it? Where is the biblical evidence of a seven-year tribulation period? So that's what we're going to do here is we're going to look at what the Bible says about this time frame of the tribulation. Um, in Matthew 24, uh, Jesus talks about the end times. He describes the events that will culminate with his return. Nowhere in this entire chapter uh, does he say how long the tribulation will last. His only comment on the length of that tribulation period is found in verse 22 where he says, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. 
So Jesus says nothing here uh, regarding a seven-year period. Uh, he just says that the events will be so extreme that everyone would die if he didn't shorten the days. Um, so in Matthew 24, we find no mention of a seven-year period. So what about in the book of Revelation? Because uh, that's where we really get an in-depth look um, at the events that will take place in this tribulation period. And granted, Revelation is very complex, very hard. There's so many different opinions, so many thoughts. And, you know, unfortunately, if you read commentaries or you read books on it like I did with the Left Behind series, you just you get so many different ideas and so many different opinions and so many different interpretations bouncing around your head. It makes it very, very, very hard um, to discern, to clearly discern what, what Revelation really says. Uh, but one thing you'll find is that nowhere in all of Revelation uh, does it mention a seven-year period. However, there are several spots where we are given a time frame, a length of time. Uh, for instance, um, and I, I'm going to be exhaustive here, I'm going to mention every time that a time period is mentioned. In Revelation 9.5, it says, And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. So here is a mention of five months. Uh, but this has to do with a specific plague and not the tribulation period. Um, so there's no clues here. There's no, there's no time frame here mentioned uh, for the tribulation period. So then the next spot we have a time frame mentioned is Revelation 11.2. And it says, uh, But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. So here we're given a time frame of forty-two months. Uh, this breaks down to three and a half years, or uh, 1260 days according to the Jewish calendar year of 360 days. So this is half of seven years. Uh, could this be the second half of the tribulation, referred to as the Great Tribulation? Or is it the first half of the tribulation period? Um, well, it's important to notice here, there's absolutely no reason to say that it's half of anything. Nowhere have we heard of a seven-year period. So we can't just say three and a half is half of seven. That's coming in with a preconceived notion. You're already coming into it saying there's a seven-year period. Oh, three and a half, it's, it's half of seven. But there's no reason to say that because we haven't heard of a seven-year period. Uh, this is simply saying that at some point during the tribulation period, uh, the Gentiles, the non-Jews, will overrun Jerusalem for a period of three and one half years. Um, and as a matter of fact, this simply could not be the second half of the tribulation period. Uh, because according to that original theory, at the end of this great tribulation period, uh, the second half, Jesus returns. But in this account in Revelation, that does not happen. According to Revelation chapter 11, at the end of these 42 months, God's two witnesses are killed. Three and a half days later, they're raised to life, and this is described as the second of three woes. So there's still time to come during the tribulation period. It simply cannot be the second half, because the second half ends with the return of Jesus, according to the theory. And we see here that this 42 months does not end with the return of Jesus. There's still time to come. It's only the second of three woes. So what about um, elsewhere in Revelation? Um, for instance, in Revelation 12, 6, it says, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she had a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. So here we see the same time frame mentioned. This woman is symbolically the nation of Israel. Uh, this time frame is a time of safety for the Jewish nation. Uh, the devil will try to destroy them, but God supernaturally protects them. In verse 14, uh, this idea is reiterated. It says, And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time, and times, and half a time, from the face of the serpent. Now a time is one year. So time, one, times, two, and half a time, half, 
would be three and one half, or 1260 days, which it mentioned previously, or 42 months, which we saw in the other verse. So again, it's the same time frame that we've already seen. According to this, according to this scripture, uh, Satan will seek the complete destruction of Israel, uh, but God protects them. So Satan then turns his attention to Christians and persecutes them. Uh, when you read Revelation 12, it's, it's, um, I think it's pretty clear there that that's what that's referring to. So again, there, there's no mention of a seven-year period here anywhere. Uh, Revelation 13, 5. And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. So here we see the beast come into power. Um, his power lasts for the same time frame that's already been discussed, 42 months. So again, there's no mention of a seven-year period. So, um, and, and that concludes the, the mention of time frames in the book of Revelation. So, if there's no mention of a seven-year tribulation period, then where do men come up with this number? Um, all we heard about in Revelation was three and a half years, or 42 months, 1260 days, time, times, and half a time, all meaning three and a half years. Um, so where's this idea of a seven-year period coming from? Matthew 24 mentions nothing about it. Revelation mentions nothing about it. So let's take a detailed look at the one verse that they say shows a seven-year uh, tribulation period. And then we're going to see that it actually shows nothing of the sort. Um, where it comes from is the book of Daniel, uh, chapter 9, verse 27. It says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So the people who promote this seven-year period idea claim that this verse is speaking of the Antichrist. They say he will sign a treaty, confirm the covenant, uh, with the Jewish nation Israel, the many mentioned, for one week, seven years. And then in the middle of this week, three and a half years, he will declare himself Israel's God. He'll cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. At that point, God will initiate the second half of the Great Tribulation period, the Great Tribulation. So it seems to make sense, right? When, when somebody brings that interpretation into it, it's, it's somewhat logical, it somewhat fits, you know, and, and that's, uh, you know, what the, I, I believe that's what the Left Behind series uh, had going for it that convinced me is it, it's logical, it flows, it makes sense. Um, but is that really what this verse is saying? So let's get this verse in context. Uh, back up to Daniel 9, verse 24. It says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, Unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks, and threescore, and two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war desolations are determined." And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So, let's dissect this piece by piece. Daniel was a man of God. Um, he had studied the scriptures, and he found that the Jewish people... Um, 
being held to cap being held captives in Babylon uh, it was just a temporary situation. So he prayed to God to let him know when his people would be going home. These verses are the answer uh, that God sent Daniel. And he got a lot more um, than just what he had asked. Seventy weeks, when spoken of prophetically, equals 490 years. How is this so? Um, well, the Bible teaches us that in prophecy, one day is equal to one year. Um, there are seven days in a week. So we simply multiply 7 and 70 to get 490 days, or in this case, years. Um, reference uh, Numbers 14.34 and Ezekiel 4, uh, verses 5 and 6 to find this. Um, so 490 years are determined upon thy people and thy holy city. Now remember, he's talking to Daniel. So his holy people are the Jews, and the holy city is Jerusalem. The transgression is the Jewish people's idolatry and rebellion against God. So after the 490 years, something would happen to finish the transgression, to end sins, to reconcile, to bring back together uh, the people and God, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and the prophecy, uh, which would be Daniel's vision of the end days and the progression of the world, and to anoint the most holy, which we know is Jesus Christ. So now the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem um, is recorded in Ezra uh, chapter 7. Now there's a lot of different opinions on this too, but uh, and and I'm not 100% on this, but this sits right with me. This makes sense. So do your own research here, but... Um, just because there, there were several different commands, there was a command to, to rebuild the temple. There was a command to, to there was a couple different uh, commands to rebuild the temple because I think the, the the progression stopped, and then a new command had to come to start again. And then there's also a command to rebuild Jerusalem, which is what was mentioned in the prophecy, and I believe that's recorded in Ezra chapter seven, and it gives the order in the year 457 B.C. So. Um, according to Daniel, according to the angel that came to Daniel, that 70-week period begins when the command to rebuild Jerusalem goes forth. So that 70-week period begins in 457 B.C. Verse 25 then states that it'll be 69 weeks, or 483 days slash prophetic years, until Messiah, Jesus. In Luke uh, chapter 3, we see the baptism of Jesus, the anointing of the Messiah. Luke 3, 1 says, Now in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of Itruea, and of the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias, the tetrarch of Abilene. There's so many details there that it's pretty amazing. They give us an, an not one, but several rulers. So history can record this date, the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, plus all these other rulers were in power so we can pinpoint the date. This happened um, in the year 12 AD. So Jesus' anointing, um, or I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I, I messed that up. He began his reign in 12 AD. So his 15th year would have been 27 AD. Jesus' anointing, therefore, took place in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, which is 27 AD. That is exactly 483 years after the commandment to rebuild Jerusalem. This proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is the Messiah. He fulfilled that prophecy to the day. 483 years after the command to rebuild Jerusalem, the Messiah was anointed, baptized, in the year 27 AD. It's mind-blowing. And when I think about it, that's, that's why the Jews were looking for the Messiah. When John the Baptist came baptizing, they said, are you the Messiah? They knew the time frame. They knew it was time. They knew that 483 years was up. Um, that's probably why the wise men uh, recognized the star in the east, too, because they also were probably aware of the time frame. They knew, hey, it's about time. 
Um, so this star must be a sign. Um, that's conjecture, of course, that that's not proven in the scriptures, but it just makes sense to me. But um, in Mark 1.15, Jesus even announced this by saying the time is fulfilled. What time was Jesus referring to? Mark 1.15, he says, and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. So in verse 26, back in Daniel, um, it said, And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. So Jesus is cut off, but not for himself. Jesus was killed for us, not for himself. His sacrifice created a new covenant for us. We were given everlasting righteousness. Our sins and transgressions were nailed to the cross. Isaiah 53, 5 prophesied about it, saying, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And Hebrews 9.28 uh, gives an account of this as well, where it says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. So when Daniel 9.26 says, The people of the prince to come, that would be the Romans, the Roman Empire. And they did completely destroy Jerusalem and the temple of God just like Jesus predicted they would in Matthew 24, verse 2, when he says, And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say, and he's talking about the temple and the city, he's looking at the temple and the city, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, for some reason, um, this verse 27 in Daniel is where we hit a snag. The people who teach that this seven-year period um, is the tribulation period, they say that this verse, uh, verse 27, applies to the Antichrist. Now, this makes no logical sense. Daniel has been talking about Messiah with no mention of Antichrist. Why would he change subject matter in mid-thought without telling us? The he, in verse 27, is still Messiah. Seven-year proponents would say that, that the he um, is referring to the prince of the phrase, the people of the prince to come. But that's referring to the Roman Empire, not Antichrist. And even if it was referring to Antichrist, the main subject matter still remains Messiah, Jesus Christ. Why would we assume that he has changed? Let, let me try to put this in context. Um, Let's say I'm telling you about my dad. My dad's a big guy. One day, he left home and he went for a drive. On the way, he stopped at McDonald's. In the McDonald's, he met the manager of McDonald's. Then he got in his van and he came home. Now, the whole time I was talking about my dad. But in sentence number four, I introduced a new character, the manager of McDonald's. But my focus remains on my dad. Therefore, the he in sentence five is still my dad. It would make no logical sense to say that the he was the manager, that the manager got in his van and went home. I never switch the focus of my story. And the same goes here in Daniel verse 27. Daniel's been talking about the Messiah. But in verse 26, a new character, the prince, is introduced. But there's never a switch in subject matter. Messiah remains the focus. And Jesus did confirm the covenant with many. Um, Romans 15, 8, Matthew 26, 28, Hebrews 13, 20, they all speak of the new covenant. Uh, Mark 14, 24 reads this, And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. In the original Greek, testament means covenant. So Jesus pretty much quoted Daniel, the covenant with many. Let's look at it side by side here, Daniel 9, 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many. 
Mark 14, 24. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. It says, uh, so you can see, that's not Antichrist confirming a covenant, signing some treaty with Israel. No, that's Jesus confirming his covenant with his people. Now, it says that he did this for one week. Um, from the commandment to rebuild Jerusalem to Jesus' baptism was 69 weeks, 483 years. Jesus' ministry was the start of the final week of the 70 weeks, that 70th week. And then verse 27 says, In the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. That's not referring to Antichrist somehow betraying his treaty with Jerusalem. Look, Jesus' ministry on earth was for three and one half years. That places his crucifixion in the direct midst of the week. Did Jesus cause sacrifice and oblation to cease? Of course he did. He was the lamb that was slain. And once he was slain, no more sin offerings, no more sacrifices were needed. Jesus' blood was enough. Sin was paid for. The need to sacrifice for our sins is over. Reference Hebrews 7.27 or Hebrews 9.24 and 25 or Hebrews 10.11. Um, as a matter of fact, the veil of the temple was torn in half, allowing us direct access to God. Uh, Mark 15, 38 says, And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. All right, so then picking up in Daniel, it says, And because of the overspreading of abominations, the temple became desolate. Because of apostasy and idolatry, God's house was turned into a den of thieves. In Matthew 23 and corresponding chapter of Luke 13, uh, we read how Jesus said in verses 38 and 35 respectively, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. He used that word desolate, just like in Daniel 9. Uh, so it's very plain to see that this tremendous prophecy in Daniel 9 is about Jesus, the Messiah, not the Antichrist. This is crystal clear evidence. I think it's the most convincing evidence in all the Old Testament that Jesus is who he said he was. Maybe not the, the clearest. You can also see Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53. Those are as equally as, as, as bombshell pro prophecies showing that Jesus was Messiah. But this is just as good as those. Um, this one goes further in that it gives dates. You know, it, it's, it's mind-blowing how, how God did this. So there's nowhere in this entire uh, section of verses that we just read in Daniel 9 that we see a future seven-year tribulation period. This does not show a treaty with Israel. It does not have anything to do with Antichrist. So we have to dismiss this completely as evidence for a seven-year tribulation period. And there's no other evidence anywhere in the scriptures to, black, to back the claim of a seven-year period. However, uh, since Jesus was cut off in the midst of the week, remember his baptism and his ministry started the 70th week. But he was crucified three and a half years into it. He was crucified in the midst of the week. So there does appear to be uh, three and a half days left of that final 70th week. There's three and a half years left for the Jewish people. Uh, because Jesus said during his earthly ministry that he came for the Jews. Uh, that ministry, his ministry on earth, his three and a half year period, that, that first half of the 70th week, was specifically aimed at the Jewish people. For, for three and one half years, they received the gospel message. Then Christ was cut off, and the ministry switched to the Gentiles. Uh, the Bible speaks of a time of the Gentiles, and, and that's the time that we currently are in right now. The ministry and work of the Holy Spirit is, for the most part, aimed at the Gentiles. The Jewish people are blind to the gospel, um, not in full. There are some Jews that get saved. There's um, Messianic Jews, uh, 
but it's rare. There's, there's a darkness over the Jewish people. And I've heard from a few street preachers who have ministered to the Jews that they are the most resistant to the gospel, the most hardened, the most violently opposed to the message of Jesus Christ. Um, but in the end times, that ministry will switch from the time of the Gentiles back to the Jews for the culmination of their 70 weeks. And I believe that's what we read about in the book of Revelation. Those three and one half years, the 1260 days, the 42 months, the time, times, and half a times, those all refer to that final period, that final half of the 70th week. So let me just summarize this. Um, and in future videos, I'm going to get into the rapture as well, because uh, right now, like I said, I just want to lay the foundation of the tribulation period. Um, but I believe the pre-tribulation rapture is an error as well that needs to be exposed. Uh, but to summarize, uh, this tribulation period uh, will last for an undefined period of time. There's no mention of a time period. In Revelation, we get those three and a half years, but it never says that that's the end because things continue on after those three and a half years. So at some point during the tribulation period, there will be a revival amongst the Jews. There's going to be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that will take place, and many of them will come to faith. As a matter of fact, uh, Paul says in Romans, uh, I think it's chapter 11, that all the Jews will be saved. And I believe that's going to occur during this period because Zechariah 12 also talks about uh, when Jesus returns, uh, they'll look upon the one they pierced and they'll mourn for him. I believe that all of Israel, all, all the national Jews will repent at that time and be saved. Um, but there's going to be a, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit and, and it's going to cause many of them to come to faith. For three and a half years, uh, Revelation talks about two anointed witnesses who will preach the gospel to the Jews. And for three and a half years, Satan will attempt to destroy the Jews, but he'll be thwarted by God. During that time, the saints, Christians, are required to endure. We're not being raptured out of here. It's just the ministry of the Spirit, the awakening, the time of the Gentiles is going to come to an end. There's not going to be many Gentiles getting saved. We're going to fall under a dark, dark period. Um, the, the kingdom of the beast, the Antichrist system worldwide, where there'll be a mark of the beast, there'll be persecution of the saints. Um, we're not going anywhere. We're going to be here for that. Um, and that's why Revelation says, here is the patience of the saints. We're required to endure. Satan's onslaught of persecution will be directed at us. He won't be able to affi uh, 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 afflict the Jews. He's going to come after us. Revelation 12, um, we will suffer the persecution of the world, uh, but we can trust God. Jesus said that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. That, that's coming. You know, we've been spoiled in America. We've been spared of that uh, because of the, the, the freedoms that we have. But uh, most of the world, Christians are persecuted and slaughtered right now. Um, so that, that's coming to us. It's, it's foolish to think that we get to escape that. It's arrogant and prideful to think that somehow we're special, so we get to get raptured out of here before it happens. No, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. The time of the Gentiles will end. Now, I believe that not many Jews will come to Christ during that time. The Holy Spirit will focus on Israel, national Israel. This world will suffer chaos as the wrath of God is poured out on the beast kingdom. Um, now, it appears that Christians will be spared of these plagues, uh, but we will be fleeing for our lives. Revelation talks about one of the plagues with these demon locusts that have terrible stings that cause people to want to die, you know, die after they've been stung, but it says that they're not allowed to sting the children of God. They're not allowed to sting those who are marked with the Spirit of God. And, and when you look at the plagues of Egypt... Um, in the Old Testament, which were a foreshadow of the plagues of Revelation. Um, you know, the Old Testament was written as an example for us, a, a lot of foreshadows. And the plagues of Egypt are a foreshadow of the end times. And when those plagues were being poured out on Egypt, Israel was spared. Um, Egypt's cattle were slaughtered. The Jews' cattle were left alone. You know, so there, there's a, a correlation there between the plagues of Revelation, I believe. Um... But we will be fleeing for our lives. 
um, while the wrath of God is being poured out on the planet and, and we're spared of that, we are going to face the wrath of Satan and persecution, which, like I said, the rest of the world already sees. It's just going to step up a notch and be worldwide. Now, for how long that lasts, only God knows. It's not for a seven-year period. That's, that's a mythical number pulled out of the air. It doesn't exist in the scriptures. We don't know how long the tribulation period is going to last. But he did say in Matthew 24 that he would shorten the days for the sake of the elect. So the bottom line is this. The world is in the last days. How long that lasts is unknown. Uh, very soon, this Antichrist beast system will unveil itself. I mean, anybody with eyes to see who's watching modern technology and, and implantable microchips and RFID and uh, how they want to tie banking into the implantable chips. Everybody's credit card already has a chip in it where all your banking's done. You can clearly see that it's not going to take much for them to say, hey, we want this implanted in everybody. And Revelation 13 talks about that being the mark of the beast where everybody will be required to get a mark in their hand or in their forehead without which they won't be able to buy or sell. So, I mean, you can see that coming. How long away we are from that, I don't know, but it doesn't seem like it's long. Um, it's And the morality of the world is, is certainly decreasing at a crazy rate, um, especially in the world of uh, uh, sexuality with homosexuality and transgender you know, transgender is something that we didn't even think about uh, on a pop culture scale 10 years ago. Now here it is. So um, it, it's clear that we're in the end days and, and this world is going to unite under this beast kingdom. The, there is going to be a beast kingdom coming and, and Christians will be persecuted. And then Israel, will, national Israel, will start to come to salvation. God will be plaguing this earth um, you know, basically giving people one last chance to repent. When you start to see things that cannot be explained um, except by the power of God and, and his wrath coming, you know, and, and, and then at the end, Christ will return. Now, this time period could last anywhere from just over three and a half years. Because um, remember at the end of that three and a half year period in Revelation, it was called the second of three woes. There's no telling how long that third woe will end or will last. Maybe it comes right away, or maybe it's a hundred years or more. We we just don't know. But God is faithful, and we must be prepared to endure. Um, so Christians, get ready. You know, stop holding on to the world. Stop holding on to materialism. Be ready to leave everything behind and trust God. Uh, the end is coming. All right. And so on the on the next video. I'll, Lord willing, I, I don't know, I'll pray about it, but I think I'll, I'll get into the uh, the pre-tribulation rapture theory. But uh, again, before getting into that, I just wanted to explain that there is no seven-year tribulation period. There is a tribulation period, but we don't know how long it's going to last. There is going to be wrath poured upon this earth. Revelation talks about some crazy things coming. Um, earth-shattering, mind-blowing things, supernatural things, you know, so... There is a, a hardship coming that we can call the tribulation or the day of Jacob's trouble or, or the day of God's wrath, however you want to refer to it. But but it's not a seven-year period. That's 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 mythical. That's not that's not shown in the scriptures. Um, so we just have to endure, however long it lasts. We have to trust God. We have to not hold on to the things of the world. You know, if we can't buy and sell, we can't get jobs. We can't participate in the economy. That's fine. Preach the gospel, even if it costs your life, you know. Uh, don't fear those who can kill and afterwards can't do anything. Fear him who can kill and afterwards can cast your body and soul into hell. Uh, Luke 12, 5 says that. Uh, fear him, fear the Lord with all your heart. Preach the gospel while time endures. You know, reach out to your family members. Pray fervently for people to be saved. And just, you know, just continue on in that. that. That's the heart of it. Forget materialism. Forget the things of the world. It's all temporary. It's all going away. And it's not for us anyways. Ours is the kingdom of light. Ours is the kingdom of God. Ours is an eternal kingdom. And we want to see people in that kingdom. And, and if the time of the Gentiles does come to an end in our lifetime, you know, I, I think there's going to be such a heavy, heavy darkness over this world that... 
it's going to be almost impossible to reach your family members with the gospel. Uh, as a matter of fact, the scriptures talk about family turning against you. It'll be your own family that, that turns you in. It'll be your own family that, that persecutes you. And, and we see that in other cultures already. If, if we look into the Asian communities where there's Christian persecution going on, a lot of times it's their own family members doing it. And, and Jesus told us these things ahead of time so that we wouldn't let the world have a hold of us, that we wouldn't let materialism and, and possessions and fame and power and greed and lust control us. Forget all that nonsense. Focus on the kingdom of God. Pray fervently for your family to be saved. Um, and just, you know, preach. Preach with all you got and just keep reaching out to them. All right, love you guys. Thanks for watching. See you next time.